I, I moved from from Florida to Portland. When I got to Portland, I, I tapped back into the a new Calvary Chapel there, and there, um, the pastor of that congregation invited me and my wife over to his house to to get to know one another. And and there, I was able to to share parts of this story with him. And he um he was he was super excited about it. And he invited me. He's like, look, I, I just like I I want to mentor you. You know, like you're, you're still you're still fresh to this, but I can see that you have a zeal and a real passion for it. So he's like, I, I would like to just do once a week Bible studies with you. And, um, you know, I would like to bring you into some of the ministry events. How would you like that? And at the time I, I was, I was stoked. I was like, yeah, you know, this is just, you know, it seems like the next step. Like I, I want to get closer to whatever Christianity is. I want to know more mm -hmm. about Christ. And so we began meeting once a week for Bible studies and, and throughout this time I'm, I'm getting more familiar with biblical Christianity. I'm going deeper into theology, trying to just get a better grasp on, on the whole thing. And so he, uh, he printed out for me the Calvary chapel distinctives, you know, so it's, it's a non-denominational church, but it still has a whole slew of things which make it what it is. Otherwise it would just, you know, look like the next thing. Mm -hmm. So, the distinctives, there are five of them, cover things like free will versus predestination and um, justification and sanctification and describing what these things are and how Chuck Smith, who founded Calvary Chapel, the way he understood these. And then the fifth distinctive was premillennial pre-tribulation rapture. Mm -hmm. um, so Calvary Chapel affirms the idea that prior to the tribulation and prior to the thousand year reign of Christ, the earth is going to be, or sorry, that the church is going to be raptured mm -hmm. and all true believers and disciples of Christ will be taken from the earth in a secret return of Christ. And so this has been depicted and it grew in popularity in the United States, particularly in like the seventies and eighties and nineties. And there mm -hmm. were whole books written about it and movies made about mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, people like vanishing out of their clothing and just, you know, disappearing and airline pilots being raptured while the Sorry. plane is in flight. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so part of me was, was really excited about this. You know, it's, it's kind of like this really uh, neat thing that we can anticipate and look forward to. Um, but the other side of me was struggling really hard to f actually, um, make this correspond with what I was reading in scripture. Cause I, Not I was to mention like history. This, yeah. this is a, a heresy that came from Scotland. Well, I didn't know that like, then. Yeah. I, I had no idea about that. Yeah. All I knew was that the scripture references that Chuck Smith was using to, to pull this from. And I guess it dates back to John Darby. Um, I forget who it was. I believe, is it a 19th century Scottish kind of some uh, Scottish pastor yeah. I think came up with it, but even if even if you don't want to say that, it certainly isn't found in the church fathers. No, it's yeah, it's new. I mm. didn't know that at the time. Yeah. I mean, because I'm I'm still a brand new Christian sure. and I'm just being introduced. But you're to having these trouble things. reconciling it even with the scriptures. Right. You know, so the the references being used are first Thessalonians. Did you 4. find that? Could you look up who kind of came yeah, up? Yeah, I'm on the Wikipedia oh, page for yeah. it. Sorry. Um First Thessalonians four, where it talks about we will not all sleep, but in we will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet and uh, Matthew 24, where it talks about the, um, you know, the end of days and even those um, talks about the days being cut short. Otherwise, even the, the elect would be deceived and parts of revelation. I think in revelation three, where one in one of the letters to the churches, it talks about not having to go through the tribulation that's in store. And so a number of these, these um, proof texts are used to justify pre-tribulation rapture, but I, I simply was not seeing it. Like I, I understood the arguments that were being read, but I felt like it was being taken off context or mm. could be explained in different ways. Um, and so I was, I was exploring the other suggestions, you know, like there's post tribulation and there's pre wrath rapture and there's pre millennial and post tribulation. And so there's a whole slew of variations on rapture theology and none of them as like, I'm, I'm not finding this in, in any one of these things. If it, when I read these texts, it seems like the church will endure the tribulation. I don't see any escape for the church that it's going to be going through until the end of time, the whole ordeal. Um, and so 
my pastor began ordering theological books for me to study. And so to hopefully demonstrate and prove to me through like scholarly research that it is there in fact. And one, he gave me this one behemoth of a book. Um, I can't recall the name, but it's a, a huge theological manual. And so I, I'm studying through there looking for rapture and he's comparing and contrasting a number of the different theories regarding it. And then he ends his, uh, his portion on the rapture by saying the overwhelming historical consensus was that there's not going to be a rapture and that this is, this is something more modern and more novel. This was in the book he gave you to read. Mm, yeah. yeah. So when, when that happened, I just, I started looking, okay, well, what is the alternative? What is the historical church? If this is new, something that, that came in the last century and a half or two centuries, we, what was the dominant opinion prior to that? And that, that put me in contact with more patristic thinking. And so I ended up reading St. Athanasius on the Incarnation and mm. loved it. And I mean, he was my introduction to the patristics and I read Confessions by St. Augustine. And so I'm, I'm slowly being introduced to earlier and earlier instantiations of church thinking. And um, while we're continuing this dialogue, my pastor and I, he encouraged me to, to go to Bible college. And so he, uh, which, which worked out just fine because as a, as a veteran, I had military benefits, mm -hmm. which would allow me to use my GI bill to go and get free education. And I thought, what better way to use it? So I, I signed up and attended Liberty University, which is a Protestant university pursuing my undergraduate in theology. And most of it, by and large, was just real modern stuff. A lot of, I guess, what would be called like deistic personalism, like an understanding of God as being, you know, something more. It, it's not the classical theology which dominates Catholic thinking, right? Where God is a, a transcendent reality, but deistic personalism is something more like God is just the highest of mm -hmm. beings. And there, there really isn't any sort of real developed ontological differences that exist between, you know, somebody like me and somebody like God, other than saying that he is the Supreme. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was a lot of that, which, you know, I, I just took it as it came and I didn't have any sort of reason to refute it, or reject it. Um, it wasn't very exciting or striking to me. Um, so I guess the, the real benefit of pursuing my undergraduate in theology was a greater introduction into the historical church. You know, so I came across names like Eusebius and Justin Martyr and Polycarp and Ignatius of Antioch. And so I started turning to them to read what, what they were saying about the church. And I mean, it didn't take long for me to realize that the church that they were describing was nothing like the church I was attending. You know what they were talking about baptismal regeneration and they were talking about justification in a way that was unfamiliar to me and um and the eucharist and you know so the list goes on and on and on about these these foreign things to me that i just wanted to know more about that i wasn't being taught about at liberty university and so i was doing a lot of extracurricular study on these on these subjects mm. and still i hadn't come across like the Catholic church. And there, there was no argument to be made from any of the places I was looking to tie these two things together. Um, and eventually I came across Ignatius of Antioch referring to this mm -hmm. church, calling it the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking at the time, I was like, man, that's, that's really strange. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> that like, it, it can't be that you know, because existing in this Protestant sphere, I was still being, introduced to like the various polemics against the Catholic church um, about it being a counterfeit church and that it was really like this uh, counterfeit Christianity disguise disguising itself, but it's really statism and you mm -hmm. know, it's like Constantine took over the church and imported paganism. And, and so surface level without doing any sort of investigation on my own, that was what I knew about Catholicism was that, from ancient times it had persecuted the true church and it had burned people at the stake and it, it had suppressed scripture and its availability to your, your average person. And, you know, so the, uh, the typical arguments yeah. made against Catholicism. Well, what's interesting in his letter to the Smyrnans is his using that term and 
differentiating this church from the splinter churches that had already arisen or the mm -hmm. splinter movements that had broken off from this church. Yeah. This is in AD 108, I think the letter was written. Um, and he uses the word without explaining the word, which has given people the idea that this word must have been in use. You mm -hmm. can't just throw out a word like that without explaining it for the yeah. first time. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even St. Augustine by this time, who I, I really revered mm. because he, he, he does have such an impact and an influence on Protestant way of thinking. I mean, he even talked about, he would not believe the gospel if it were not for the authority of the church. Mm -hmm. And so the, I, I, I didn't really know what to make out of all of this. Um, but I was just going to be led. Like I, I was keeping myself opening open to that. Just, just be led, mm -hmm. see where this goes. Um, I, I was, I was absolutely certain that the closer to the apostles, the closer to Christ I got there, like at the epicenter of Christianity, I would be getting something pure, yeah. something less adulterated, something less corrupted by the progression of time. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, do us a favor, leave a comment, let us know what you thought of the video, like, and subscribe.